Welcome to our third and final component on food additives and looking at the specialized categories that we're likely to encounter or are kind of hot topics for us when we're talking about food additives and that relationship to adulteration. And this is a really great last topic to touch on in preparation for next week's discussion on consumer expectations, consumer lawsuits, and looking not only at uh, lawsuits that involve illness, but lawsuits about our, what we perceive food to be. And we've had a little bit of discussion about that this week. And here we're looking at a really specialized category, a category known as irradiation. And as we'll see, it's in the video. Not everyone in the industry likes that term. It uh, has some connotation. But when you're dealing with statues as old <clears throat> as we're dealing with, uh, you've seen everything from 1906, 1938, 1950s these terms are outdated and uh, they seem perhaps scarier than they really are. So this image is kind of fun because when we think of food additives we necessarily don't think of uh, radiation coming in contact with our food even though it does um, from UV rays to microwaves you know there's a number of ways that we can have our food treated uh, but when you mention irradiation people think of this idea that suddenly their food will be glowing or that there could be some other really heinous component to it. But we're really not talking about anything too uh, serious in that regard. So we always start with our statutory definition, and you may notice this definition looks familiar, but I didn't include this little parenthetical. I cut off the definition when we talked about food additives. I didn't want to bring our attention to this component until we were ready to discuss it. But this is the fuller definition in uh, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, subpart S. And you'll notice that even at this time, we have this definition where we're including uh, packing materials and everything that we talked about when we said food additives. And then we have this additional component and including any source of radiation. And so, you know, irradiation was in our concepts when we we're talking about this. And we'll get into the history. But this is something that we've been discussing for a long time. And so both our definition of food additive as well as our definition of adulteration. We talked about in the last component that if you had an unapproved color additive, it was adulterated. If you have a uh, food that has been irradiated through an unapproved process, and here we're talking about process versus something that's in the food, then it is also adulterated. And this idea that we're talking about process over something that's in the food. You know, when we talked about food additives, you were adding a stabilizer, an emulsifier. You could be adding an ingredient, a whole ingredient into a product, and you were adding something. Color additives, you were adding something to the food that changed its color, and you could see, and it was a, this idea of being a component of a food. And here we're talking about affecting the food. We're having an effect on the food. There's this great, um, photo that the FDA always uses in their presentations on irradiation, uh, talking about what irradiation can do in terms of disrupting the DNA of microbes that may be on the food that both relate to illness as well as preservation of the food. And so we're really not talking about something that is in the food per se. The ra irradiation sort of hits the food and, and moves on and perhaps, you know, there's some lingering component of it, but really we're not talking about that. And so we have this question, we talked about it in the first component on food additives, direct food additives, indirect food additives, and we have this question, what would we classify irradiation as? Do we classify it as direct? Do we classify it as indirect? And, and does it matter? You know, and we saw in the readings and in the lecture that there's this idea of thresholds for indirect food additives uh, versus um, direct food additives. So keep this in mind. This will be, as, as we get into this uh, fifth week and next week we have both a lecture and a final exam to give you a heads up, there will be a question centered on this. It won't be on irradiation, but I want uh, in, the, in the exam to give you a question where you have to make a argument uh, for a particular additive to both classify it, whether it is an additive, how it's an additive, and then to give an argument 
on whether or not it's direct or indirect. And this is a great way to start thinking about that because radiation is unique in, in, in this way of uh, being a food additive. So as I mentioned, we have a long history in the U.S., around the world, of using irradiation. And surprisingly, you know, beginning as early as 1905, a lot of the literature that you'll find on irradiation really points to World War II as the birth of the technology and, and sort of the growth and affordability of that technology uh, to be pervasively used. And it was an, enough of a use in, in that time for the addition of the food additive amendments that we have to, in 1958, that we've talked about, to bring radiation into that definition of food additive and to bring that unapproved irradiation into our definition of adulteration. Now you'll see this uh, KGY, that's the units that are being used, and we have a video that will explain that unit of measurement for the amount of uh, radiation that can go into particular foods. And uh, this applies both for meat products, as you're probably guessing by this point in this week, uh, we have the food amendment, uh, food additive amendment, and it's applying both to the irradiation of meat products as well as to other foods. And uh, overall, the FDA has done extensive studies to look at irradiation in different uh, applications, and, and we'll see we have a list of the foods that it's approved for use in and what their applications are for. So we've seen a couple of different processes at this point in terms of how to get a food additive on the market, how to get a color additive on the market. Irradiation is different and we can kind of imagine why it would be different. The FDA really views this as a technology that a process that needs to be carefully considered its application, its use, prior to it being used. So we're not going to have a gross uh, generally recognized as safe for the process. We're not going to have a standard that we can necessarily follow in all cases. We are going to have a a bit by bit approach for the FDA and the FDA in, in its guidance document says that it will continue to evaluate and issue regulations on the use of irradiation, what applications, what food products it can be used on, and it will also consider petitions and there's not a necessarily a formal uh, petition that's required. We saw that you know, we have a color additive petition process, we have a food additive petition process. The FDA has something different here and it's a citizen's petition where industry can say, a uh, facility can say, we want to use irradiation in the following process. And you go through a very extensive public process of attempting to uh, have the FDA issue a, a new rule to allow irradiation in that case. And so you don't see this happen often, but it, it is something that happens and, and the radiation regulations not only apply here, we'll have this video that really gets into that discussion, but are pretty pervasive in the market for medical device, cosmetics, and other areas. And so the FDA is expanding and is testing this application, looking at dietary supplements and a few other areas. But it is one that is very slow to, to change, and it is one that requires a, a, an extensive process to get uh, change. So, uh, yeah, there is a way to do it, but it's uh, it's one that's treated with caution. You may have noticed this little symbol at the beginning of the uh, presentation on the title slide there. And the FDA has two labeling requirements, or one labeling requirement with two sort of components to it. And this symbol is called the radara, right, I'm never sure how to pronounce that. And that symbol is required along with this phrase, treated with radiation, treated by irradiation, irradiation, for whole foods. Uh, so if you have a bag of salad and you're having that bag of salad irradiated, then it would need to have the symbol and to have the one of these phrases on there. If you have a box of cereal, you have a baked good, if you have something that it isn't obvious, it's not a, necessarily a whole food, and one of those ingredients, for example, the flour, has been irradiated, 
then there's no special disclosure requirement. No need for the symbol, no need for the phrases. The FDA sort of has this expectation that the consumer will know there has been some processing to both maintain the quality during the process, you know, no deterioration or rot, and to ensure that it's not microbially uh, contaminated, E. coli, uh, all those sort of things. And so the FDA says there's no need for special disclosure. So there are times when consumers could be eating irradiated ingredients as part of a food product and not know it. But for the most part, if you're eating it, exclusively, if you're eating in a whole food area and you're having salad, fruits, something that has been uh, of that nature that's been irradiated, you will know. Uh, there's a few other minor labeling requirements uh, that relate to making sure that it's prominent and conspicuous, these phrases and, and use of the label. But otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. So it's not often that you see the symbol, but you'll, you'll run into it occasionally in the grocery store. So here's our list of permitted foods. And you'll notice that probably the longest use of this and probably the, the highest uh, amount of irradiation that's used is for NASA. And NASA has full FDA approval to sterilize and to uh, use this in its um, preparation for astronauts. And, if, and one of the higher levels, we see only spices getting to a, a higher level. And so we have this uh, both threshold for what amount of irradiation can do, which should be a clue to you that this is um, classified by the FDA as an indirect food additive. We've set a, a threshold amount for what we deem as to be safe. And then we've, we've specified it by food, and we've specified it for a particular application. And so we know now when we have a facility and we're attempting to use this, this process that we have to go through, these specifications we have to meet, and what we necessarily can, can use it for. And what is important also, and the FDA is very clear in this when, when relaying this information to consumers, is this is not the silver bullet. So if I go and I buy poultry that has been irradiated, that doesn't mean that I can go and consume it raw or that I can go and undercook it, uh, leave it out on the counter, and then cook it a couple days later. I still need to follow um, good kitchen practices, I guess we could call them, uh, safe handling mm -hmm. procedures to make sure that I'm not contributing and I'm also ensuring that if there is any microbes on it, any salmonella, uh, any of those, that I'm taking the steps to, to kill those. And we'll see in the video, most uh, facilities that use irradiation will not claim 100% microbe kill, that this isn't a 100% kill step. They'll claim up to 99.9, .9, which is significant, but they still leave that, that room to say there is the potential for this to end up being um, harmful. So there's this really great video that gets into a facility that's using irradiation, talks about a little bit the regulations, talks about consumer uh, perceptions and in different industry terms. Industry really likes to talk to this about as a, a form of pasteurization, uh, and that gets into that in this video. So I, I wanted to, to leave this uh, last component with this video. I think it will answer a lot of your questions and insight if you haven't seen this used in a facility. And that's where we'll leave it for this week. I'll play this, this video, and then uh, we'll get into new topics next week, our last week together. And uh, as I mentioned, we have um, sort of a, a double header next week. We have both the uh, lecture and reading assignments, and we have the final exam. And there will be two. Um, there will be both the lecture up, and then there will also be a separate video that talks about the expectations and any um, discussion on what the final exam looks like. So uh, enjoy this video, and we'll uh, convene next week. Is there such thing as 100% pathogen-free food? No, there's not. And there never is anything that's 100% risk-free. But we're here at the SADEX facility in Sioux City, Iowa, to learn about a technology called irradiation. It's a process where they use a small amount of ionizing radiation and they treat food products and feed products to kill the bacteria that are in those products. The irradiation of food also safely reduces spoilage bacteria, insects, and parasites. In certain fruits and vegetables, it inhibits sprouting and delays ripening. And our astronauts have been eating irradiated food since the beginning of the space program. 
So let's join Harlan Clemens, President and COO of SADEX, and take a look around the facility, find out what irradiation is all about, and the potential it holds for a safer food supply. The GAO did a report back in 2000, they're reviewing that report, but they, where they found that at least 99.9% .9 of harmful pathogens such as E. coli 0157H7, the different types and strains of salmonella, listeria, campylobacter, all are reduced by at least 99.9 to 99.9% .9 using irradiation. The CDC reports that there's going to be additional types of bacteria and, and pathogens that are going to be uh, mainstream, some of these are becoming antibiotic resistant, and with that, the only real source to, to take care of those pathogens is through radiation. Um, we've had people in the USDA, we've had people in, uh, in the CDC, as well as the FDA come out and say, if you're going to grow something in the dirt next to irradiating it or cooking it, you're not going to make that product safe because those pathogens will survive and if a consumer takes them in, and if they have a compromised immune system, they're going to get sick. The U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates that productivity losses as a result of foodborne illness amount to $37.1 billion annually. Furthermore, recalls of contaminated food have resulted in severe economic losses to the affected industries. While irradiation can help us protect our food supply, our irradiated food products safe for our consumption. Well, with regards to the, the safety of irradiation, um, you know, a lot of products are irradiated. Uh, consumers, I don't think, realize the importance of irradiation. Sunlight is a form of radiation. Um, they actually receive, you know, standing out in the sunlight, you receive a certain dose, and, and medi uh, medical doctors suggest that you receive a certain percentage of that. Um, when you get into certain types of food products, a lot of food products are treated with UV light, which is a form of irradiation. So from the standpoint of safety, irradiation is just another term. You know, potentially, I, I think the term is, is misconceived that, that a person is receiving a dose of radiation, but there's actually no dose uh, involved with regards to anything, any residual from the irradiation. And in the case of electrons, it's simply electricity that the, uh, the electrons have been pulled off of that passes through the product that disrupts the DNA pattern. Same thing with the cobalt. The products don't actually come in contact with cobalt. It is just a form of uh, uh, radiation that's given off from that cobalt. So the products are actually not radioactive. They're very safe. Um, consumers uh, use those products on a daily basis and they don't realize that. With the exception of spices, where radiation is a common practice, Less than 1% of all food products are currently irradiated. When we look at the non-food product sector, though, the technology is commonly used. Uh, non-food products that are irradiated that consumers use every day would be eye solutions that, for contact solutions. That product is immediately absorbed into, the, to your uh, into your body through your eyes. Other types of things are feminine hygiene. Cosmetics are irradiated uh, for safety to eliminate bacteria. Um, baby bottle uh, nipples, um, pacifiers, toothbrushes, uh, band-aids, um, various types of uh, cotton swabs and things like that as well. During irradiation, products are exposed to carefully controlled amounts of ionizing radiation for a specific time to achieve a certain desired objective. This process causes chemical, not nuclear changes and is very similar to the conventional cooking and preservation methods that we commonly use. All irradiated products do need to be labeled as being irradiated and carry the irradiation seal. This misconception that irradiation is, you know, a, a bad term, and potentially maybe it is. Um, you know, there was a decision several years ago, 40 or 50 years ago, that, that said irradiation was an, uh, was an additive, and, and really you're not adding anything to that product. Um, there's been talk about whether the wording should be cold pasteurization or electronic pasteurization, and maybe those are better terms from the standpoint of how we're treating the product with regards to, to making it safe. I think the key is, is that the consumer is aware that their products are safe. Food irradiation can be an important tool in our war against illness and death from foodborne diseases. We do need to remember, though, all irradiated products need to be stored, handled, and cooked in the same way as we handle our non-irradiated food products.